Um, sometimes innovation, it's a, it's a term which uh, obviously people that are working in a very focused area will have moments of inspiration and think, aha, we've found new ways of doing things that can change, change context, can bring great benefits. Sometimes collectively, though, we struggle. What is it exactly? And Henry Ford famously said, if I'd asked the people what innovation looked like, they would have said a faster horse. Uh, so we, we have to sort of think about how we break down the elements of innovation. And we're very privileged this morning to have Future Crunch here to help us look at one aspect of innovation. Uh, Dr. Angus Harvey and Dr. Tane Hunter from Future Crunch, they'll, they'll look, you can see their bios uh, in your program. They're incredibly bright people. But Future Crunch is an entity that provides, as they say, clear, positive, intelligent thinking about the future to help individuals and organisations understand what's happening on the frontiers of science and technology so they can be better prepared to meet the challenges ahead. So Future Crunch came, was created because they felt they were tired of hearing the same old content put forward by people in the innovation space and they want to cut through the hype and critically evaluate the consequences of new technologies and scientific breakthroughs that are crunching together. So please welcome Future Crunch to the podium. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tane. My name is Gus, and we're Future Crunch. We're really excited to be here today. Thank you very much for having us. We live in an age of unprecedented progress. Science fiction is becoming reality. In the next 10 years, things are going to change so rapidly that the world in which we live, work, and play will be fundamentally transformed. Yet the vast majority just are not prepared for this. Now, we've all heard of innovation. We've heard it many times today. It is the in vogue buzzword. But innovation is fundamentally underpinned by rapid advancements in science and technology. We're now capable of harnessing some of the most powerful forces in the universe. And as all good Marvel geeks know, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> it's crucial that we not only understand the transformative power of science and technology, but also the associated risks. And once we understand this, we can act more wisely both as a society and in our own lives. Now, that's why Gus and I started Future Crunch. It was to educate and create a debate about our common future. It's about evaluating the consequences of all these converging technologies that are crunching together and how to harness them to make this place better for humanity. Now, we're really excited about science and technology, and we think it could create a better world for everyone. We believe that the future will be more transparent, more abundant, and more peaceful. But even if you disagree, perhaps some of you think that technology and science are having negative consequences. Well, then as Sun Tzu said, know thy enemy. Regardless of what side of the issue that you're on, we believe that the role of science and technology needs to be in public debate. Unfortunately, right now, that debate is pretty much non-existent because as a result of funding cuts from both sides of the political aisle, Australian science funding is at its lowest level in 30 years. So Australia, by some accounts the richest country in the world, now ranks 18th of the top 20 OECD economies in terms of the amount that it spends on research and development as a proportion of GDP. The CSIRO, one of the world's great national science research institutes, has lost one in five jobs in the last two years. So if you think the funding cuts have been bad in the aid sector, in the science sector, it's even worse. To us, an American and a South African, that just seems insane. We live in a world where science and technology is becoming fundamental to everything we do. And what we need is more funding to really prepare for that. And we're not getting that from the people that are supposed to be giving it to us. And so it's up to us to engage with these issues and these debates and to start talking about this. So we're going to take you on a little tour through some of the more exciting things happening on the frontiers of science and technology. Now, we don't want to stand up here and blow smoke up your ass and tell you that everything's going to be fantastic in the future. What we do want to do, though, is make sure that the debate about the world that we're all going to be living in is clear, critical, and intelligent. So now Gus and I love nerding out about this stuff. I'm a biology nerd, and I've had a love affair with biology for as long as I can remember. 
So I'm a bioinformatician, and what that means is I use big data in the biological world to solve biological problems. Currently, I work in cancer research, where I help improve prognosis, diagnosis, and treatment with those affected with cancer. My background is in political economy. I did my PhD at the LSC in looking at research into deforestation in developing countries. So development economics was very much my background. But more recently, I've moved into the technology field, and I currently run an Australian organization called Random Hacks of Kindness. And what we do is we put together coders, basically geeks with a conscience, and then we put them together with charities and community groups, and we bring them together to try and hack open source solutions to some of the big problems facing us. So Tana and I aren't exactly natural collaborators. He's a real scientist, I'm a wannabe scientist. And those two groups don't usually play so nicely in the sand pit together. Or another way of putting that is that if we were in a boy band, I'd be the cool one, and he'd be the dorky one. Yes, while Gus is comparing hair dyes with the groupies, I'd be at home nerding out to some David Attenborough documentaries. <laughs> but what we do have in common, though, is a shared love and respect for science, technology, and rationality. We're not only positivists, we are positive. We're really excited about the future rather than frightened by it. So let's show you what we mean by that. And to do that, we want to start by asking you a very simple question, and a per question that's very pertinent to what you do. If you had to give the human race a score between 1 and 10, what would that score be? 1 being that the human race sucks, and 10 being that the human race is awesome, we're thriving, doing everything we can. And maybe what we'd like you to do is just put up some hands there and give us a number. Whatever comes first to your mind. So we've got a 4, 5. A seven? That's a great that's ten. Good. Oh, ten, yeah. Woo. Thank you. Um, your answer to this question really depends on where you're getting your information from. And if you're getting it from where most people are, the mainstream news, it might look a little bit like CNN's top ten news stories of 2014, the most watched and discussed news stories of last year. Number one was, of course, the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. Followed by Malaysian airline flight 370. Then there was the, there's the ISIS scourge and extremism in the Middle East, a story that's very much still with us today the Ferguson shootings in the United States. There was the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. Celebrity deaths, such as that of Robin Williams. Who could forget, of course, the ice bucket challenge. <laughs> Malaysian Airlines had a bad year last year, Flight 17. There was the Israeli invasion of the Gaza Strip. And Boko Haram. And an 11th story thrown in there for good measure, which was a terrifying combination of two of the top three stories on CNN last year which was Ebola, the ISIS of biological agents. <laughs> so it's not exactly good news, is it? In fact, the best way of describing this is as an apocalyptic highlights package with some celebrity news and an internet sensation thrown in there for good measure. And yes, by almost any measure that you care to use for the average human being on planet Earth today, the world is a better place than it has been at any point in human history. In the last 200 years, global life expectancy has more than doubled to a aver global average of over 70 years. Places like Australia, it's now over 80 years of age. We're really close to eradicating the world's second ever global disease after smallpox, the guinea worm. In the past 30 years, we've reduced the factor of guinea worm, uh, the incident, by a factor of 28,000. The World Health Organization now views this disease effectively wiped off the face of the planet. 2013 marked our tipping point in the fight against AIDS, at which point more people were receiving antiretroviral therapy than were being infected with AIDS. We're going to see a steady decline in this disease. This really is the beginning of the end in our fight against this devastating disease. Now, we're also winning on malaria, another one of the world's biggest killers. Since 2000, we've re reduced the infection rate by 25%, and we've halved the mortality rate. As a result of treating these kinds of preventable diseases, more children are living to see their fifth birthday than ever before. In fact, as many of you know, the WHO and, the U and UNICEF released their latest figures on child mortality in early September. And what they show is that we've just had the 43rd year in a row where the global child mortality rate has come down. We've saved the lives of 22 million children in the last 22 years. That's more people than have been killed by all forms of war and violence in that period. That is the greatest news story of our time and yet we don't hear it in the media. And we're doing incredibly well on extreme poverty. Again, the World Bank released the figures in early October saying that we are now down to less than 10% of the planet that are living in extreme poverty. 
The world population increased between 1990 and 2010 from, 1 .9, from, from about 5.5 billion people to 7 billion people. And yet the total number of people living in poverty in that, in that era decreased from 1.9 billion people to 1.2 billion people. That's the greatest economic news story of our time. And yet we don't hear it in the mainstream news. As you can see over here, we're now in a world where fewer people are living in poverty, fewer absolute numbers of people living in poverty than at any point in the last two centuries. That's an incredible achievement and something we should all celebrate. And the world's becoming better educated and more literate. In the 1970s, around half the planet could read and write. Today, that number is more than four-fifths in both areas. And the people that can't read and write are part of the older generation. So we're moving into a world where everyone is literate and has some form of schooling. And this is one of the most astonishing pieces of research we've seen in recent years, because it shows that global war deaths are on a steady downward decline. In fact, historians are calling this era the long peace. 69 years that two major world powers haven't gone to war against each other. The hippies sang in the 1960s about world peace in our time. Well, we're closer to achieving that as a species than we have been at any point in our history. And I often have to remind myself that in 1983, the year I was born, racism was still legally mandated by the government in the country of my birth, South Africa. Aboriginal land rights weren't recognized here in the state of New South Wales. Homosexuality was illegal in the state of Victoria. And in some parts of the world, like Liechtenstein and Namibia, and even certain parts of Switzerland, women still didn't have the vote when I was born. So we're making huge strides forward in my own lifetime as a more compassionate, more caring, and more global species. So, why is it that we have such a negative view of a world that by almost all accounts is improving? The answer lies in our biology. So inside my brain, inside all of your brains, is a series of connection and synapses that are hardwired for threat detection. They center around an area known as the amygdala. It's old evolutionary programming, but while it's old, it's incredibly powerful. Whenever you see that something that's threatening or dangerous, it overrides all other higher functioning parts of the brain. This is known as the amygdala hijack. Now, another thing is the car crash effect, our tendency to gawk, stare, and discuss things that are potentially dangerous or scary. It's great if you're looking out for tigers and bushes, because it allows you to pass on your genes. However, in today's world, it's simply not as necessary. Chances of mortality through injury and violence are more than a thousand times less compared to our ancestors. Getting attacked by a wild animal is so small as to be effectively zero. Unfortunately, though, the media knows this. They know that we're primed to react to the negative stimuli. They know fear is captivating, and they use it to sell us stuff. So take Ebola. Last year, this horrible disease killed 7,400 people. Well, there was another terrifying killer out there that killed the same amount of people bad doctor's handwriting. <laughs> so the media hand selects these stories that know captivate us and entice fear within us, and they use it to up their ratings. Media studies show that bad news outweighs good by a factor of 20 to 1. Now, we all know that sex sells. That's why Gus and I launched a nude fireman calendar. <laughs> it's not exactly flying off the shelves, no, no, no. but our partners bought a couple, and we're pretty popular in the gay community in Melbourne. So <laughs> So sex sells, but so does bad news. And we're being fed a steady diet of bad news to up ratings, and it's really distorting our view of the way we look at the world. And coupled with social media, and now popular media is truly global, we're not getting bad news from our friends, and just our friends and family, but from all over the world. And this is distorting our view of the way we view the world. Now, we should be clear here, we're not standing in front of you today and saying that the world is a perfect place. We have huge challenges still facing us. Racism, homophobia, sexism, those things aren't going away on their own. We have so much room still to cover, so much ground to recover, to, become, to get a world that's equitable and fair. And we face huge challenges still, in particular around environmental degradation and climate change, as everyone already knows. Uh, as, as we've all seen in the last few months, big issues around international movements of people, and, I'm sorry, we've got some clicker issues here, and big challenges around economic inequality, which the OECD is now saying is the single biggest economic issue facing us. However, it's often easy to be cynical about the world the whole time, to say that nothing's ever getting better. Most of us got into this game because we had a sense of optimism. We thought that things could get better, 
and they are. And our successes in the past should give us confidence moving forward, not only as the development sector, but as a species into the future to say we can overcome these new challenges. What type of world are we moving into? Well, as a result of rapid changes and advancements in science and technology, things are changing at an incredible and increasing rate. The magnitude of disruption is simply profound. Now, management professors love this type of thing. They call it disruptive innovation. It's the idea that successive waves of innovation come along and swamp out entire industries. Now, if you're writing for Harvest, Harvard Business Review, they just can't get enough of this stuff. Unfortunately, that's not quite right, though, because new technologies don't come along and wash away all the old technologies. Instead, what happens is they come along and get stacked on top of everything that's come before. And so at any given point, you still have access to all the old technologies. So a more appropriate metaphor might be a cross-section through sedimentary rock. And so you get this complex, multi-dimensional landscape where technological progress is unevenly distributed across sectors. And more importantly, access to technology is unevenly distributed. And so really good disruptive innovation is the kind that makes products and services available to a proportion of the world's population that previously didn't have access to that. And it creates more value for society as a whole than the people that created that disruptive innovation capture. So this complex multidimensional landscape it's this complex interplay of social dynamics, of politics, human geography, history, economics, and how they interact that really determines how innovation plays out. That complexity for us is deeply humbling, but also it's incredibly exciting because we have the potential here to really make the world a better place. So technology, if you do zoom out far enough, it grows exponentially. It's like a snowball rolling down a hill. It starts off slow and small, but rapidly picks up speed and size, and sometimes triggers an avalanche. This is crucial because our brains are wired to think in a local and linear way. Let me give you an example of this. If I take 30 linear steps, each a meter, I end up 30 meters away. Not very exciting. If I take 30 exponential steps, each doubling in distance, well, in 30 steps, I end up 1 billion meters away, or I've orbited the Earth 26 times. So we often underestimate exponential growth, and it's easy to do. Our ancestors grew up in a world and evolved that was local and linear. Most things were within a few days walking distance, and calculating where a tiger is going to pounce is a linear function. So we're left with these evolutionary hangovers that leave us ill-equipped to deal with the speed and scale which things are changing all around us. Now, this leads to a perception gap. It means when we try to predict technology, in the short term, we overestimate it. But in the long term, we greatly underestimate it. Now, this is known as Amara's Law, and it happens from everything from medicine to mobile phones. So what kind of world are we moving into? What we want to do here is, is kind of change gear a little bit, I think, and, and talk about five major disruptive trends that we really think embody this idea of disruptive innovation. This idea that say, science and technology can make the world a better place and give access to products and services to people that didn't previously have it. And the first big story is, of course, that technology is becoming available to everyone. Now, that wasn't always the case. Technology used to be something that big companies did, and more recently it was for the middle class, you know, for most of us sitting in this room. But in the last few years, it's become available to everyone on Earth. This is a picture of someone in Syria, in Aleppo, over here, we've got a guard on the border of North Korea and China. And these are some Tanzanian porters who are halfway up Mount Kilimanjaro. And what you can see they all have in common there is that they are as addicted to their mobile phones as we are. So as a result of this mobile phone revolution, we're already in a world where 3 billion people are online. And 2 billion people are connecting to the internet now via their smartphones. By the end of this decade, 4 billion people will be online and all of those people will be connected to the internet via their smartphones. That's 80% of all the adults on Earth. This has been driven by two main trends. The first is known as Moore's Law. Many of you would have heard of it. It states that the number of transistors on a computer chip doubles every 18 months. It doesn't sound so impressive, but in reality it means that the new iPhone 6 has 625 times more power than my first ever computer, which was a 1995 Pentium desktop. And the other thing that's going on, which is something that most people haven't heard about, is something known as Cooper's Law. And then in some ways, it's even more remarkable than Moore's Law because it's held true since the first ever radio transmission by Marconi back in 1895. The effectiveness of personal communications 
has improved by over a trillion times since then. In, what that means is we're now in a world where you can get the, something like this, the Form P9 smartphone from India. It costs less than $30, and it's more powerful than the original iPhone. It means that we're moving into a world in the next five to 10 years where an extra one to two billion people are going to come online. That's not only tens of trillions of dollars of new economic buying power, but more importantly, it's an extra one to two billion people, an extra one to two billion sources of ideas, and that have the networking power of the internet at their fingertips. That's going to change everything. And not only that, they're going to be using technology in new ways too. This was shocking new news to me. But currently, half of the world's population has no access to any form of banking. That means that 50% of the world can't even get a loan for something as small as $10. But three years ago, only 30% of the population had any access to banking. Now, so we're, humans are rapidly using technology to overcome this. Now, I would venture to bet that any two people in this room, unless you're part of the same bank, cannot instantly transfer tr funds electronically. Well, 80% of Kenyans can, and this is growing rapidly in the developing countries. They're using systems like M-Pesa in Kenya, which allows you to instantly exchange value via text message. Now, also, new platforms are arising that allow international remittance, which also is bigger than international aid flow already, and it's allowing this system and this flow of money to be more efficient. Now, things like blockchain and Bitcoin um, are really going to revolutionize our, and disrupt our financial system. So it's the idea that two people want to exchange value, and they can do it without a third-party guarantor. So if you want, you can exchange value an anonymously, sorry, and you put it into a public ledger, and it's validated by the crowd. So countries, developing countries, are leapfrogging the financial systems, and the traditional financial banking system. So it's going to be hugely disruptive to these systems. This is going to be a huge game changer. We talked about economic inequality. We believe these technologies can start to chip away at that. So now, people look at this stuff and they go, oh, well, I mean, that sounds great, but it's, it's, I don't really know how it works. It's kind of geeky. Maybe that's just something that's a hobby for coders and geeks. It's not going to change anytime soon in my sector. But remember, that's what the internet was like back in the 1990s. Does anyone remember that? <laughs> Does anyone remember the sound that it used to make? <laughs> the internet sucked in the 1990s. It was slow, it was clunky, the UX was horrible. You definitely wouldn't have put your credit card details onto it. You couldn't buy stuff onto, on it. And what happened is that in each of those cases, a company came along and solved those problems. So Amazon solved the problem of retail, PayPal solved the problem of transactions, Google solved the problems of search. And what's gonna happen with these new technologies like blockchain is that small companies are gonna come along they're going to solve the problems with it, make it accessible to all of us, and they're going to be the global giants of the future. So we're seeing innovative change in the way we connect and the way we exchange value. We're also seeing disruptive change in the way we make things, too. We're seeing a flattening of the manufacturing process away from big corporations and into the hands of small companies and individuals. 3D printing is leading the charge, and it's already a disruptive technology at the commercial scale. They're using it to create specialized parts for engines to get us into space. It was a key technology to create the world's fastest commercial car, the 1-1. And they're even printing the classics now, like the body of this Shelby Cobra. Now, 3D printing is being used in new ways all the time, unleashing totally new forms of creativity. Now, in my industry, the health industry, they're using it to create specialized body parts, which doctors can practice surgery on. They're now printing more efficient medications, and they're printing scaffolding, which you can grow a new organ from stem cells. Now, I don't know if anyone's broken an arm or a leg, but the cast, the itching drives you insane. Well, 3D printing will make this a thing of the past. And incidentally, they've added ultrasound to these casts, which allow bones to heal up to 40% faster. Now, Japanese scientists are very close to printing full organs. Now, that's called bioprinting, and they use a combination of stem cells, proteins, and other synthetic compounds similar to collagen. Now, if they pull this off, it'll have huge ramifications in the medical industry. 3D printing is improving all the time, too. They're now using it to print electronic circuits. They're using new techniques called laser sintering, where you 
use powder, you print powdered metal, fuse it with lasers, allowing us to get great resolution at the micro scale. Now, NASA has started printing objects in space, in zero gravity. Now, can you imagine Apollo 13 when they had their problems? Engineers on the ground could design spare parts and tools that they were needed, beam up the schematics, and hopefully solve the problems. This is going to be a key technology to our continued exploration of the final frontier. Now, last year, we were pretty excited about this really ugly house. But while it's not aesthetically pleasing, a Chinese company printed 10 of these in 24 hours. Great for low-income housing. And they used only recycled materials to do so. Well, in the beginning of this year, they're now printing mansions. That's exponential growth. They print internal and external decor. And these mansions go for way less than a one-bedroom house here in Sydney. So, they're also designing new forms of 3D printing where you can literally draw in air, in multi-axis, and print in, the, in that way. Now, this is really cool. An Amsterdam company has developed this technology, and their first application is going to be to build beautiful bridges over the canals in Amsterdam. What's really cool about this technology is it needs no human intervention. The machines print the tracks which they autonomously move along on. Now, Carbon 3D in the US earlier came out with a totally revolutionarily, revolution, revolutionary new way to print. So it's the way that they use ultraviolet light, which allows objects to literally rise out of liquid pools of plastic and metal. Importantly, it sped up 3D printing a hundredfold. So now it's on par or faster than many of our traditional manufacturing practices. Now, Google's just invested $100 million in this technology, and Ford has now gotten them on board to produce a majority of their car parts. Now, if you want to think about the disruption this creates, think about the way most consumer products are currently made, where the raw materials are shipped to a location, say, in China, and then assembled using specialized technologies at each stage of the process, packaged together with far too much packaging, by the way, and then it's sent to you via a number of intermediaries who all take their cut to here in Australia. 3D printing has the potential to strip out every single node in that supply chain. So you go straight from the raw materials via one or two service providers to the finished product in your own country. Think about the disruption that that creates for the global sweatshop industry and its terrible working conditions like this sweatshop that collapsed in Bangladesh last year. What does that mean for the global container ship industry and its accompanying carbon emissions and sometimes oil spills? And one of my favorite side effects, no more wasteful manufacturing processes because you only use the materials that you need, and any materials you don't use in that run get incorporated into the next one. That means, as the other key thing about 3D printing is that it's a democratic technology. So a 3D printing machine costs the same in Togo as it does in Australia. And so we're seeing countries like the Philippines and Egypt start to develop these maker spaces and hacker spaces where the technology they use is as accessible to them as anybody else on the planet. And they can download schematics for products and services, for, for products that they want to create, that really flatten out the manufacturing curve. Let's talk about something we are particularly passionate about, renewables. Unfortunately, not much good news here in the last few years in Australia. However, on a global scale, it's completely different. Renewables are heating up, and it's really being led by solar energy. Come on, say it. Solar is the new sexy. <laughs> He says it all the time, and it's just, anyway. <laughs> I think it's cheesy, but he loves it, anyway. All right, so solar really is leading the charge, and we're already into the third generation of solar panels. Most people think solar panels are still those blocky things that you see on roofs, but in the third generation, we're starting to bend them onto uneven surfaces and stack them into layers, which has doubled their efficiency. And we're moving into the fourth and fifth generation now. In the fourth generation, you can literally paint solar onto the roof, I wonder if the battery over here, just the tech people, do you guys have any spare batteries? <laughs> Sorry, tech, I'm really struggling on the clicker over here. Thanks. So fourth generation solar allows you to paint it onto the roof. And in the fifth generation of solar, which is where we are now at the University of Michigan, you can literally install solar into clear glass panels. Now, if you want to think about disruption on a mass scale, imagine that in 10 years time, or maybe 15, a city like Beijing, Every single window, every single car windscreen, and every single mobile phone screen is a solar panel that's generating electricity. And once you start to think like that, 
then you start to realize that we may be moving into a world where energy is clean, cheap, ubiquitous, and completely abundant. Start thinking in terms of exponential growth. Now, fossil fuels proponents will tell you that this is pie in the sky kind of stuff, that we're not going to see any changes anytime soon. Renewables only account for about 2% of world power generation, so that's just wishful thinking. But remember, solar, like many of the other technologies we've talked about here, is an exponential technology. And it obeys its own exponential technology law known as the Swanson effect, which states that for every doubling of global solar capacity, we see a decrease in price of 20%. And of course, that's a positive feedback loop because as the price drops, capacity goes up. Thanks very much. And people who kind of get this wrong are the International Energy Agency. That's a classic case of how this linear thinking applies. In 2000, so what they do is each year they release their predictions of how much solar and wind is going to be deployed internationally. And you can see that every year they get it wrong, so they keep on having to revise their predictions upwards. So in 2006, they thought it was going to take us until the 2020s to get to where we are today already with wind, until, until, until the 2030s to get to where we are today already with solar. Their current best prediction is that, int that solar energy will be the dominant energy source on the planet by 2050. So, how many times are they going to revise that estimate downwards in the next decade? If you want to see what this kind of disruption looks like, the newspaper industry is a great example. It, like the fossil fuels industry, it came into being in the 19th century, and in the last few decades experienced record growth and profits. And what's really interesting here is that the technology that kills it, the internet, kind of comes into its own in the 1980s. And newspaper executives see no reason to change what is very obviously a great business model. And in the early 2000s, some of the more enlightened executives are going, hmm, maybe we should start paying some attention to this. And in 2006, the sector goes into free fall. 2006, incidentally, is where Twitter is launched. And so along with a number of other social media platforms, it means that people aren't reliant on newspapers for their news anymore. Now, the fossil fuels industry is in the same place that the newspaper industry was in about a decade ago. And many developing countries already get that. This is a picture of a solar plant in Rwanda. It now accounts for 6% of Rwanda's total electricity generation. This is a picture of the first ever fully solar-powered airport. And it doesn't, it's not in a developed country. That's in India. These countries get it. And what they're doing is they're bringing into being a new world where renewable energy is the norm rather than the exception, which is great, right? <laughs> because it's high time we stopped using 19th century technologies involving digging black rocks and dinosaur juice out of the ground and burning it in order to power the 21st century. All right, Gus and I like to finish things off by getting personal. So let's talk about what matters most, how we take care of our bodies. I'm sure many of you remember the Human Genome Project that started in the early 1990s. Well, it took 13 years to complete and $3.3 billion. Now, today, in my job, I crunch human genetic data every day. This is an Illumina gene chip, and we can fit five human genomes on here. So five molecular codes that make us for the atomic level up. And it takes about $1,300 per person, and it's done in less than a week. Now, the current cutting-edge sequencing technology fits in the palm in your hand and plugs into a USB stick. So this is going to allow this type of technology in medical diagnostics available to everyone on Earth. And you're already seeing this technology spreading quite rapidly. So this one, the mobile phone with this attachment, is a portable mobile AIDS and syphilis test. And it only costs $30, and they're deploying these in Africa. Now, in the future, you will be monitored 24 hours a day by a multitude of arrays and devices monitoring different health levels. They're not going to be around your wrist or in your clothes or in your glasses, but they'll be underneath your skin and in your bloodstream. Now, it seems invasive to have this type of technology within you, but we already use this type of um, plan in other industries. Take a Boeing engine. It has 100 different sensors in it. And when something is sensing that it's going wrong, the plane lands, grounds itself, and is fixed before it falls out of the sky. Why wouldn't we do that for ourselves? Now, nanotechnology is going to be your friend and will underpin many of these technologies. So what's nanotechnology? It's the ability to create things at the atomic level with super precision. Now, it happens between 1 and 100 nanometers. Well, what's that mean? To put this into perspective, one nanometer next to a meter stick is the same as a blueberry next to the Earth. 
and we're already making stuff at this ridiculously small scale. Now, that fantastic notion of a team of doctors and machines shrunk down so small that they could course through your veins and cure all your ailments is popular science fiction trope from the 1950s. But we're well on our way. In scientists at the Institute of Bangalore in India have created artificial nanostructures that swim through undiluted human blood. Scientists at the uh, University of San Diego have created micromotors that run on your stomach acid, and importantly, they harmlessly decompose. Now in cancer research, they're using nanotechnology to encapsulate multiple cancer drugs and deliver them directly to cancer cells. Now, this precision is incredible because our current therapies such as chemotherapy and radiation poison a large portion of the body, if not the whole thing, to kill a relatively small population of cells. So nanobots in your digestive tract and in your bloodstream will intelligently scout out early signs of disease and pathogens like Alzheimer and cancer and deliver medication in very precise ways. All of this information is gonna be continuously and wirelessly sent to medical servers. They're gonna know you're having a heart attack before you do. Now when you have signs of a heart attack, you, will, will, you and your family will be sent a message and they'll dispatch a drone with a defibrillator <laughs> to keep you alive until the ambulance arrives. Now at the hospital, they can grow you a new organ for transplant, such as a heart. Now think about what the personal organ growth is gonna do to <laughs> the organ enlargement industry. Now, for, for less urgent cases, such as a flu or infection, you will be prescribed a digital medication which you can print at home or at your local doctor's with a computer. It sounds crazy, right? But the computer was developed by the University of Glasgow, and they're scaling it up for use at hospitals, doctor's office, and mobile field clinics around the world. Now, healthcare, like everything we've talked about today, is growing exponentially. And that means life expectancy is as well. Now, this totally blows my mind, but on linear trends, for every day that you live, on average, you gain six hours extra of life. That means what we've been rambling on up here, on average, you've all gained 10 minutes extra of life. All right, so let's wrap things up. We came here, I guess the reason we, we, we do future crunch, the reason we got into this, it's, it's not our main thing, we both have other jobs, is that we believe there needs to be this talk about the future, that we need to all be engaging in it. And the problem is that right now, conversations about the future are dominated by two groups. The first group is the media, and they have an interest in pushing bad news at you so that they, so that you, they can get eyeballs onto it. And the other group that's interested in the future are technology companies and they use the future as a marketing tool. But the future is something that we're all going to participate in, and all these changes that we've talked about here are going to happen in our own lifetimes. And so it's crucial that we start engaging with these issues and start talking about them, as I said earlier, not just in the development sector, but as a species or here in Australia. What we hope we manage to convince you of is the world is a much better place than you're being told it is. Things are changing faster than you think, and that we're even evolutionarily equipped to deal with. But knowledge is power, and we believe one of the most important tools that you can have for the future is an understanding of how rapidly things are changing, and an understanding of these trends and disruptive innovations, which will help make this place better for all humanity. Now, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We didn't get to touch on cool stuff like virtual reality. Uh, Internet of Things. Quantum computing. There's incredible stuff going on with brain-machine interfacing. Drone technology. Um, Data-driven agriculture. Artificial intelligence. Uh, and uh, the space industry, which is incredible advances going on there as well. And a whole host of other areas that have the potential to completely change the world in which we live, work, and play. This is the crunch, and it's happening now. So let's leave you with four things to maybe take away and think about after this talk. Um, and yeah, just some, something to, to try and encapsulate everything we've spoken about. Cool, the first one is try and be aware of your local and linear thinking. Try and think in terms of exponential growth. Be aware of Amara's law and understand that the crazy technology that we see today will be commonplace in the future. Unhinge your mind to a whole new raft of possibilities. The second thing is try and be aware of that negativity bias and the car crash effect. Understand that the media has a commercial logic that's predicated on fear and inaccurate perceptions of risk, and they're distorting our view of the way the world truly is. 
The upside of this, of course, is that you get to be a conduit for positivity. So the next time you're at a conference or you're at a dinner party and someone says, we're all doomed and human beings are terrible and the world is going to hell in a handbasket, you can say, by almost any account that you care to use, 2014 was the best year in human history. Three, disruption is happening to everyone. It's happening to you, to your organization, and to every person on the planet. But being aware of this, these disruptive innovations and these trends and learning how to harness their power is crucial if we want to make this world a bright future. And that's something that I think all of you will go out there and be doing in your day-to-day -day activities. The final thought would maybe like to leave you with is to, under, to, to view today's problems as opportunities. To say that the big challenges that we face are opportunities to make the world better. And the organizations, the companies, the individuals that come along and solve these challenges, those are going to be the success stories that we celebrate in the future when we're all standing here again in 10 or 20 years' time at the ACFID 60 or 70th, 70th conference. So as one of the great minds of the 20th century, Buckminster Fuller once said, you don't change things for the better by fighting existing realities. If you want to change things for the better, you build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Thanks for paying attention. Thank you. Thanks so Thank you, Angus and Tane from Future Crunch. Don't you all feel more optimistic now about the future? Don't you all believe the SDGs will be achieved by 2030? And if you don't, it's just your wiring in your brain. So just reflect on that.